welcome back and here in this video we are going to take forward our discussion of shoulder complex biomechanics into one of the most important and commonly discussed joint in the shoulder complex which is that the glenohumeral joint or the shoulder joint which we often call as the shoulder in this, this video we will be discussing about the glenohumeral joint the articular surface the type of the joint the motions of the glenohumeral joint and the difference between proximal and distal articular surface and something extra like the angle of inclination angle of torsion retroversion posterior torsion etc and finally we will be dealing with accessory structures in the glenohumeral joint so let us explore the glenohumeral joint in the most simplified way. Yes, uh, the glenohumeral joint is the joint that is formed between articulation of glenoid fossa with the head of the humerus. This is a quite known statement for all of us. Now, let us examine the joint in particular. We always have a strategy to understand the joint. One is that the type of the joint. What is the type of the joint? The glenohumeral joint is all of us knows that it's a ball and socket type of synovial joint. What type of joint it is? It is a ball and socket type of synovial joint. Clear? It's a ball and socket type of synovial joint and hence it is no, it's a triaxial. Therefore, it has how many degrees of freedom? Three degrees of freedom, three rotatory and three transitory degrees. The degrees of freedom of the joint includes uh, three rotatory, three rotatory and three transitory degrees of freedom. So the type of the joint is a ball and socket type of synovial joint and it has three rotatory and three translatory degrees of freedom. Now, now what was our next strategy, next topic to discuss the articular surface. Of course, we know the articular surface, which, what are that? The glenoid fossa. The glenoid fossa is one of the articular surface and the second one is that the head of humerus. The glenoid fossa and the head of humerus, right? The next heading under which we will study this joint would be the accessory structures. The accessory structures. Do we have a menisci or a disc in this joint? Of course not, but we have some structure known as the glenoid labrum. Then we have the ligaments and then we have the capsules. And finally, the motions which we will discuss later, three rotatory motions, which you already know, flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, medial rotation and lateral rotation. Now let us examine the joint under various headings. We already know what is the ball and socket type of joint. We know how many degrees of freedom that joint has. And now let us explore into the articular surface of this joint. Okay, the articular surface can be divided into the proximal articular surface to the proximal articular surface and the distal articular surface, distal articular surface, proximal and distal articular surface. What is, which jaw bone is the proximal articular surface? This is the glenohumeral joint. Okay, and now here, which one would be the proximal articular surface? The humerus or the scapula? Definitely the scapula is the proximal articular surface. The proximal articular surface is the glenoid fossa in the scapula. This is the glenoid fossa which is located laterally to the scapula. Of course, can you clearly, closely observe what is the glenoid fossa? It is a small concave shallow facet. It is a small concave shallow face. It's a shallow, right? It's a concave, but it's a shallow. It's not that deep like the acetabular fossa in the which one? Femur. So here it is a small shallow facet. Okay, this small shallow facet articulates with the head of the humerus and that creates a problem. You know, the head is very large head of the humerus that articulates with this very small glenoid fossa. 
and that is a reason stability of glenohumeral joint one of the major reasons of instability of the glenohumeral joint is the articular surface of the glenoid fossa is very small as compared to the articular surface of the head of the humerus of course that stability is compromised for mobility which we will see later but this joint is inconcurrent and unstable right now we have some more peculiarity with the scapula and the glenoid fossa the biomechanics or function or the movements at the glenoid humeral joint can alter with the scapula how you know the resting position of scapula which we have discussed earlier right that is a slightly internally rotated anteriorly tilted and upward rotated so the resting position of the scapula on the thorax as well as the acromioclavicular joint which is the next joint here and the sternoclavicular joint definitely influence the orientation of the glenoid fossa right so if there is an alteration in the resting position of scapula definitely it can alter the congruency between humeral head and the glenoid fossa if there is an alteration in the closed chain kinematics of acromioclavicular joint and sternoclavicular joint, if there is some movement restriction, or if there is some slightly elevation, or if there is a posterior rotation, anything like that, the glenoid fossa may be altered. So the uh, articulation may be altered. So the position, the resting position of scapula in the thorax with respect to the acromioclavicular and sternoclavicular joint can influence the congruency of a glenohumeral joint not just the resting position the position of the scapula itself we know that scapula has a slight anterior tilt about 10 to 20 degree if that tilt is greater definitely you see that this is the glenoid fossa normally now if the scapula is tilted what can happen the orientation of the glenoid fossa changes and articulation becomes inefficient if it is posteriorly tilted definitely the same can happen so the glenoid fossa orientation also influence the stability or the articulation between glenohumeral joint if the glenoid fossa is a slightly anterior tilted or greater a slightly posterior tilted or if the resting position changes then definitely what can happen the glenoid humeral joint articulation can become more inconcurrent or will be affected badly right and also the scapula can be slightly anteriorly rotated okay antiversion of the scapula or scapula itself can be slightly posteriorly rotated posterior rotation known as a retroversion of the scapula so the anterior ro rotation or antiversion of the scapula as well as the retroversion of the scapula can also influence this joint what is the, uh, the simple thing to understand is that uh, the glenoid fossa is something that articulates with the head of humerus. Definitely if there is any alteration in the shape or orientation of the glenoid fossa that can influence the joint badly because already the joint is an incongruent one. So if the resting position changes it affects badly. If the anterior uh, tilt or posterior tilt occurs it will affect bar in a bad manner and if there is an antiversion or retroversion of the scapula of course about uh, 6 to 10 degree antiversion and retroversion is normally seen that also can influence the glenohumeral joint stability or the concurrence am i clear so that are the important factors which you need to write about the glenoid fossa it is a shallow concave facet concave facet articulates with the head of humerus then there's three factors you can write down one is the resting position of the scapula second one is the orientation in anterior and posterior tilt and third one is the orientation itself that is uh, uh, what you call the antiversion and retroversion antiversion and retroversion of the scapula itself clear now what about the distal articular surface the distal articular surface is your head of humerus and you can see that the head of humerus is very large as compared to the glenoid fossa right so the head of humerus nearly is spherical 
it forms a half of a sphere like this half of a sphere or one by third portion of a sphere so the glenoid force ahead can the humeral head can maintain or contribute to half of a sphere like this half of a sphere or one by third of the sphere if you look closely you can see that it's a nearly spherical but not completely spherical so the glenoid humeral head is very large as compared to the glenoid fossa and also it forms one by third to one by half or uh, half of the uh, sphere one by third to half of a sphere right yes now there is something like uh, the angle of inclination and angle of torsion which you are already which you might have been already thorough if you have studied or if you have listened to my previous video on the hip complex biomechanics there we have detailedly discussed what is angle of inclination and angle of torsion so what is angle of inclination what is angle of inclination if anybody have, um, has any doubts on this, uh, after listening to this, just check on to that video because there we had discussed much more than this one. So, we have the head of humerus over here, okay? Then we have the greater tubercular, tubercular, etc, etc, etc. And then we have the shaft of the humerus, okay? Something like this. So, the head of the humerus and then you have the neck and head and neck okay here you have the head of the humerus here you have the neck of the humerus and this is the shaft of the humerus if we draw a straight line if we draw a line joining the head of the humerus to the neck or if you draw a line which passes through the head and neck of the humerus this line intersects another line which is the longitudinal axis of humerus any long bone has a longitudinal axis so this two lines that is the uh, a line joining the head of humerus and the neck with the line joining the longitudinal axis of the humerus makes an angle at their intersection that angle is known as angle of inclination normally 135 to 150 degree am i right so the line joining its uh, angle of inclination is an angle made between line joining the head of the humerus with its neck as well as the line joining the longitudinal axis of the humerus so uh, it is an angle formed between line joining head of humerus and head and neck of the humerus with the uh, longitudinal axis of the humerus which passes through the shaft of the humerus that is known as angle of inclination okay we had discussed angle of inclination in the which one in femur and coxa varga coxa vara which is a variation in the angle are also were also discussed in that video i will give you a link of that video if you can just look on to that so this would be angle of inclination a straight line passing through the head this is the head through the neck so head to the neck it will be up to here passing through the longitudinal axis a straight line so here you have that angle and that is known as the angle of inclination this is very important if you are a student they might ask you what is angle of inclination and what is angle of torsion just explain it in detail and draw a diagram and write down the normal value you get the good marks now there is another concept known as the angle of torsion what is that angle of torsion what is angle of torsion angle of torsion of a humerus so um, the same head and neck we are taking okay here we have the head and neck of the humerus like this okay and what structure do we have if you look it in this direction so this is the head and neck and here which structure we have over here at the lower end that is the condyles lateral and medial femoral uh, uh, humeral condyle medial epicondyle and the lateral epicondyle of the humerus 
So, if there is a line that connects the head and neck of the humerus and a transverse line passing through the condyles of the humerus, that line makes or that angle that is made between two these lines is known as the angle of torsion. It's a bit confusing, I know that. We can examine it in an easy manner. For example, let this be the humerus. So, and here let this pair, this uh, marker denotes the land transverse line passing through both the medial and lateral epicondyle or lateral and medial condyle of the humerus. So, this is the line. Okay. Now, there is no problem if I take this line forward like this, like this, like this, like this, like this, like this, like this. It's still that transverse line. Okay. It's still that transverse line. So, I got that line over here or more clearly, I got that line somewhere over in the center of this bone. It will be the line passing through this one. So, I got that, that line like this. Okay. Now, there is another line which of course passes through the head and neck of the femur, humerus. For a better understanding, I am keeping it down. So, this is that line which came up to this much. We draw, dragged it upwards for our understanding. There is an another line which we are drawing like uh, we have the head and neck. There is another line which is going to pierce the head like this and the neck of the humerus. So, it will be denoted like this. So, this lines, this is the line, the transverse plane or transverse line or horizontal line through the condyles and this is the line which is passing through the head like this. It pierces the head and comes through the neck. So, this lines makes an angle here. That angle is known as angle of torsion. Am I right? Or is it clear? The earlier line, the angle of inclination was very easy because you just have to draw this line and you just have to intersect it with this one. But here, you have to imagine that this line is coming upwards. Okay, that is for our understanding. So, this humeral condyles is actually transverse. So, the transverse line or the transverse plane, I am taking it up to here and I am drawing another line which passes through the head and neck of the humerus. So, this line forms an angle over here. That angle is known as the angle of torsion. So, the earlier one was like this. Earlier one was like this. This would be that angle. This is uh, this one. That means this line is horizontal. Earlier line was longitudinal. This is horizontal. Okay. That is the only difference over there. Earlier line was longitudinal. So what is the longitudinal structure over here? That is the shaft of the humerus. So if this line is longitudinal, it will pass through the shaft of the humerus. If this line is transverse, it will pass through the transverse structure. That is the condyles of the humerus. So this is that angle of torsion. So angle of torsion is simply angle made between head and neck of the humerus always with a line passing through the condyles of humerus, medial and lateral condyle of humerus. Usually that value is about 30, uh, sorry, usually that value is about 30 degree posterior. That means your humeral head is slightly rotated or tilted posteriorly. That is known as the posterior torsion posterior torsion or a retroversion. So we can say that humeral head is slightly posteriorly tilted or posteriorly rotated. That is known as the retroversion of the humerus. So normal value is about 30 degree posterior. Therefore, we can say that humeral head is slightly posterior torsion or retroverted. If this angle of torsion is uh, not 30 degrees, less than 30 degree, then we say that the uh, humeral head is antiverted. So the opposite of this posterior torsion is known as the anterior torsion. So the femoral head may be anterior torsion. So these are the two possibilities, but this is what commonly happens. And this is very minimal in clinical studies or in clinical scenarios. Okay, so we have two conditions at is uh, angle of torsion and angle of uh, inclination. And something that uh, we need to remember in resting position or in anatomical position, the head of the humerus is uh, medially 
okay it's not laterally like this it's it's not uh, no um, i cannot show it in this way through one the other bone okay so it's uh, not laterally tilted but it's a uh, medially tilted this head is a uh, medially tilted if this is the glenoid foursum if this is not uh, like this of course we can show with this one itself if it is like this it's a uh, laterally tilted so the head is medial the head is a uh, superior it's not going downwards but the head is a uh, superior the head is superior, head is medial and slightly posterior. You can see that it's having a posterior orientation. So in anatomical position, the head of the humerus is medially, superiorly and posteriorly. What is that you mentioned? You, you need to remember this when you are writing the uh, distal articular surface. That is head is uh, medially, medial, posterior and superior in anatomical position that is the normal orientation of the head of the humerus and we have two angles okay anterior version and posterior version now why do we have humerus in slightly retroverted position this is something applied aspects if uh, you don't want to remember it uh, you just uh, can skip it this one why is it retroverted because you know that uh, the scapula is a uh, slightly internally rotated that's its resting position it's not straight one it's slightly internal rotated now if humerus is uh, instead of being posterior torsion that is uh, this is the posterior torsion head is slightly into the posterior plane this is the anterior aspect of the humerus and this is the posterior aspect head projects posteriorly or head is going to the posterior aspect if the head was going mid anteriorly what would happen already this glenoid fossa is a slightly internally rotated or anterior now this head also is anterior what can happen there will be very less concurrency between this joint so what happens is that this head becomes a slightly retroverted so that more articular surface can be covered so this retroversion of humerus increases the joint stability what is that the retroversion of the joint humerus increases the joint stability and if there is a greater retroversion of course great amount of lateral rotation can happen but very less medial rotation can happen okay there is situations in which humerus can be anteriorly tilted or antiverted then there will be very less stability okay am i clear so the retroversion of the humerus is a strategy to increase the stability of the joint because of the orientation of the glenoid fossa which is a slightly internally rotated so that this retroverted position gives more space or more articular surface in contact for the humeral head and if the retroversion is greater then of course uh, there can be greater amount of lateral rotation that is possible within this joint but of course this is a uh, medially this is uh, retroverted then definitely the medial rotation will be limited there are scenarios in which anterior rotation is uh, seen but uh, that's not quite uh, known like uh, retroverted position of a uh, humerus so you need to remember these things and now we straight away go on to the accessory structures one of the most important accessory structure in this joint is uh, something unique to this joint and uh, seen in the hip joint you can just tell its name that is the labrum we have a tabular labrum and glenoid labrum what do you mean by glenoid labrum or what do you mean by acetabular labrum in the hip joint what are the structures okay so glenoid fossa you can just look at here this is a very shallow surface naturally this joint is highly incongruent and instable so body has a mechanism through which there is a structure that is known as the glenoid labrum there is a connective tissue structure that is going to cover the periphery not the interior the periphery of the glenoid fossa so this will cover like my finger the periphery of the glenoid fossa so what can happen so what happens over here okay this is the normal concavity of the glenoid fossa when my finger covers this this one like this okay what happens is that that concavity is going to increase so this is a structure which is seen attached to the periphery of the glenoid fossa so this is the periphery and you have some concavity over here this will be attached to the periphery of the glenoid fossa so this structure what happens is that it makes the glenoid fossa more concave it makes the glenoid fossa more concave. So glenoid labrum is an accessory structure which is seen attached to the periphery of the glenoid fossa which increases the concurrency by about 
Fifty percentage. Oh God, that's a greater amount. It increases the congruency by about fifty percentage. More congruency seen between because of this glenoid fossa. Sorry, glenoid labrum. Not just that, the it has a contribution to the stability. It also has some other function. So the glenoid fossa uh, first function is that it increases the concurrency, which we discuss now. First one is that it increases the concurrency by 50 percentage. The second function is that it prevents um, the humeral head translation. Humeral head translation. What is that? Okay. Now you see that this is the glenoid fossa. Here the glenohumeral uh, joint, the head of the humerus is relatively free, less articulation. So it can move in superior direction, inferior direction, medial, lateral, or anterior, posterior. That is the translation can happen. But we have some structure which is attached to the periphery of the glenoid fossa in relation uh, so that it is getting attached to the head of the humerus itself. So this one will prevent, this glenoid fossa will prevent the translatory movement movements of a humeral head so it prevents the unnecessary translatory movements of the humeral head excessive translation not the normal one translation is important for the normal biomechanics of the joint excessive translatory forces or motion can be decreased by the humeral head the glenoid labrum now the third function is it prevents the it protects the bony it protects the outer ridge of or bony margins of glenoid fossa bony margins of glenoid fossa see here so this is the glenoid fossa this is its periphery now you can see that the head of humerus if it is directly articulating there can be friction between this head and the periphery this periphery is bony ridges okay it's a slightly projected bony ridges interior or which is concave will not cause the problem but the periphery can get uh, degenerated or get rubbed with this one and creates friction so this glenoid fossa uh, glenoid labrum is something like a tissue which covers the periphery and so smoothens it so that the head of the humerus do not articulate with or get in contact with the periphery but the contact with the get in contact with the glenoid labrum so it prevents or protects the outer ridges or bony margins and next function is that it reduces the friction which we saw already reduces the friction so less bond to bond rub means less friction less bond to bond rub means less friction it also dissipates the joint contact force what is that it also dissipates joint contact forces contact forces okay joint contact force or joint compression is very serious problem if there is an excessive joint compression bond to bond compression it can lead to greater degenerative changes greater pain and other problems other complications so what happens is that there instead of preventing or creating direct bond to bond contact we have this glenoid labrum which helps in the contact and also this glenoid labrum dissipates the force in the outer direction it dissipates the forces in the outer direction so if you have some forces coming over here this labrum actually dissipates that forces rather than the force being concentrated in this area when the force is concentrated in an isolated area it can lead to greater stress over that area and compression so this labrum actually dissipates the force in different direction right so these are some of the functions of a glenoid labrum. What is that? It uh, increases the concurrency. It prevents the humeral head translation, protects the outer bony margin, reduces the friction and dissipates the joint contact force. Okay. And last function is that it serves as an attachment site for glenohumeral ligaments and long head and uh, by a tendon of uh, biceps brachii what is that it act as an attachment site for the ligaments of the glenohumeral joint as well as the biceps brachii tendon so these are some of the important functions of glenoid labrum 
so greenwood labrum is a very important structure and a very uh, crucial structure for more normal smooth functioning of the glenoid labrum if they ask you glenoid labrum for examination point of view just write down this notes draw a diagram and just explain it and but uh, if you are professional remember glenoid labrum is a very important structure that it can help in dissipation of the force and in normal biomechanics of the joint this we wind up this video and next video we will see the glenohumeral ligaments and the capsule and structures like the coraco acromel arch bursa etc in the glenohumeral joint until then stay tuned and if you like the video don't forget to click the like button and kindly subscribe to our channel